This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number 22. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey folks, it's Matt Sicoria here on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. We are coming back at session 22. And I think before we get into too many details, I do want to apologize to you guys. It's been quite the podcasting hiatus that I've been on, and uh, there's been a few reasons that have contributed to that, one of which is I've been working on this project of uh, creating CE opportunities for listening to the podcast. You know, I didn't really have that in mind when I first started the show, but what happened was I would get an occasional email from a listener saying, hey, you know, we're really digging what the guests have to say, we're learning a lot, and so on and so forth. It would be awesome if we can get some type 2 continuing ed for this. And so I'd get an occasional email that came in that went along those lines. And then once those emails started becoming more and more of a thing, I decided to kind of try to figure out how to make that happen. So I uh, went into that. And uh, so now with selected podcast episodes, you can earn Type 2 Continuing Education credit for listening to the show. Uh, The way it works is you would go to behavioralobservations.com get CEs and uh, click on that. And then once you uh, go through that process, uh, you'll be prompted again to listen to the show if you haven't already. And then you take a quiz and then you're good to go. You get your certificate and you're on your way. So I've got a couple of them up there right now and I'll be adding more as we go forward. So uh, feel free to check that out. But again, that process took way longer than I thought it would. So again, I apologize for the delay. Uh, But I am really excited to present today's guest, uh, Dr. Linda LeBlanc of Trumpet Behavioral Health. She's the uh, executive advisor there, and she's also president of LeBlanc Behavioral Consulting. And in this episode, uh, we cover a lot of really uh, new topics, at least new to me, uh, specifically with behavioral approaches to supporting uh, older individuals. And so she is an expert in that field. And so we talk about the intersection between behavior analysis and gerontology. We also talk about performance management or organizational behavior management in human services agencies, which is obviously a very timely topic given the rapid expansion of our field. And then we also talk about how to embed ethics in a lot of what we do, a lot more of what we do. And so we could be making ethics the forefront of a whole host of things that perhaps we're not taking advantage of right now. So uh, it's just a fun conversation. We cover a lot of ground. It's one of those conversations that probably could have gone on for a couple of hours if it weren't for the constraints of time. Uh, I did get a chance to ask Linda some of your questions. So members of the mailing list, uh, I will send out, for those of you who don't know, I will send out uh, uh, an email to the list saying, hey, I'm going to interview so-and-so, and and if you have any questions about this topic, feel free to shoot me an email. And so I got a chance to uh, ask some listener questions, got some great answers from Linda. Uh, Again, she was just a, a wealth of information and really enjoyed my conversation with her. Um, But before we get to that, I also want to let you know that uh, I will be going to APBA in uh, just uh, next week, actually. So that is uh, happening next weekend uh, in March, and I am really excited to go check that out. I've never been to New Orleans before, so I'm going to be going back and listening to the interview with uh, my friend Mark Bologna on all things New Orleans, and probably checking out his podcast, Beyond Bourbon Street. And uh, there's going to be a reception there on Friday night. I hope to see a lot of you there. And I know there'll be lots of uh, behavioral observations guests who will be there as well. And so uh, if you're there, uh, feel free to say hello. Um, I'll be the middle-aged guy with glasses and a beard, and so I should stick out like a sore thumb. So, uh, you know, I should be easy to pick out. And again, uh, all kidding aside, I love meeting listeners and look forward to seeing you there if you are attending. So um, I think that's probably enough housekeeping for now. And again, I want to thank Dr. LeBlanc for coming on the show. And uh, without any further ado, here is our conversation. 
Dr. Linda LeBlanc, welcome to the show. Thanks for being on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, you have uh, been a frequent person that people have requested to be on the show, and I'm happy to, that we kind of uh, nailed down your schedule and uh, that you were able to come on. I've got uh, a couple of listener questions that people have sent in, and I've also got a bunch of questions on my own. We'll probably get to just a fraction of them because I wrote down so many, but I'm really excited to have you on to talk about things relative to doing organizational behavior management in the context of clinical services and also enlighten us on an area that, you know, frankly, I and probably many of my colleagues don't know a heck of a lot about, which is using behavior analytic uh, practices, et cetera, in the service of uh, individuals in, with, uh, uh, in the geriatric population. So, um, yeah. Uh, so what I want to do, though, before we get into all that is, uh, like I like to do with uh, all my guests, I like to hear how people got into behavior analysis. So if you have a minute or two, just kind of tell us how you got into the field, you know, what was the first class and all that fun stuff. Well, like many others uh, who get excited about our field, uh, I had a great undergraduate learning class um, that uh, you know, it just when I was taking that class, it felt like it captured all of my attention and excitement almost away from my other classes. And, you know, it just it was felt easy to get that perfect score in that class and to be excited about it. And um, I was a psychology major. It was one of my psychology classes at Louisiana State University. And then when I decided to pursue a PhD in clinical psychology, I was fortunate to be accepted into that same graduate program at LSU, which was quite behavioral. If I had gone to a different uh, graduate training program in clinical psychology, there's a good chance that that interest in behavioral psychology would not have been as fulfilled as it was, given that um, I had the opportunities that I did at LSU to work with multiple behavioral researchers and to take multiple classes um, in applied behavior analysis. I see. So the first class was, was, was like your regular undergraduate learning class? That's right. And then in um, graduate training, um, you know, not only was I taking classes in behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy with both children and adults, but I was able to, um, as a part of pursuing my minor in school psychology, uh, take classes specifically on applied behavior analysis, single subject research design, because the behavioral psychology, I mean, or the school psychology program at LSU was quite behavioral. And so some of my uh, professors, such as Tim Vollmer, taught those school psych courses from a very behavior analytic perspective. And I had the opportunity to work in their research labs as well as doing my own research in behavioral clinical psychology. Were you in the track that would say be providing uh, what, what I'm, I'm using air quotes here so the listeners can't see, but, you know, kind of <laughs> traditional therapy to, uh, you know, whether it be kids or adults? Um, obviously, your uh, CV is uh, replete with, uh, you know, work in the field of autism. So I just I'm curious, that, you know, so was that a, a program that could provide, you know, pr prepare you as a general practitioner, if you will, in the field of, uh, of psychology? So my um, degree is in child clinical psychology, and I'm a licensed psychologist. And my specialty area was autism and intellectual disabilities, but really throughout the lifespan. So young children with autism, all the way up to um, elderly adults, um, at first with intellectual disabilities. Now, I was fortunate um, there, and it, it's probably part of what led to my interest in behavioral gerontology because um, there was a developmental psychology program with professors that specialized in aging. And I had the opportunity to not only take classes with them, but um, eventually even do some research with some of them. So my training um, at a specialist level was in autism and disabilities. But every um, licensed psychologist um, that comes from an APA approved clinical psychology program also has um, a thorough training in, 
you know, basic interpersonal adult therapy, child behavior therapy, behavioral pediatrics, um, or at least the ones from behavioral programs do. Sure. Um, so I've done family therapy, adult psychotherapy, generalist kind of child behavior therapy, but the vast majority of my work has been in the field of disabilities, kind of broadly construed across the whole age, uh, age span. Oh, wow. Very cool. Well, wow, what a, what a depth and breadth of experience. So I'm glad you're again here to share it with our listeners. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I do want to get into the gerontology piece, but I know you're doing a lot of work focused in, uh, organizational behavior management. Uh, so I, I've got some questions, uh, relative to that that I'd like to get into first. So, um, you know, I, one of the first questions that I started thinking about when we were kind of formulating the list of topics or potential topics for this interview is that, you know, whether we're talking about autism intervention or geriatric services, what would you say are the kind of big picture training and management challenges associated with supporting direct care staff? You know, I think that's a great question. And that information that you need to know to be an effective uh, practitioner um it really does include organizational behavior management. And any time you get beyond being the person who will solely design and implement the programming, you need to influence other people to be able to execute on that programming and to design that environment and maintain that environment, hopefully as an approximation of how you would um, do it if you were there. And what that means is that you have to have a thorough understanding of how people um, behave, uh, learn, and what uh, motivates them in an ongoing fashion to continue to do things well. And I, I think that that's the core of organizational behavior management. And so, you know, it's um, a common pitfall for people to train their staff primarily by telling them about maybe even a few ideas in behavioral psychology or behavior analysis and then telling them what they would like them to do and maybe even showing them. But the literature in so many areas has shown that without those other core components of a full behavioral skills training package, um, without rehearsal and feedback, you're likely to get not very good to okay implementation, and you may not do well on maintenance of what you're trying to um, teach the person. And so the person being able to rehearse the skills with feedback and to a criterion is something that um, certainly Denny Reed and Ray Miltenberger have been telling us for a very long time. And they've been right since the first time they've sure. said it ever since. Um, you know, when you have a lot of people to train, a lot of programs on which to train, you know, the response effort of doing a full BST is, you know, that's one of the likely explanations why we don't all always do what we know works best. And sure. so it's a great illustration of how we are susceptible to all the pitfalls that any person might be susceptible to, regardless of the fact that um, we know the rules about what we ought to do well. So I do think that core step of using a performance-based and competency-based model for training your people is critical. It's a necessary but potentially not sufficient um, strategy for um, really ensuring that the quality of your um, human services are going to be the way that um, you want them to be. I think the other parts of OBM that are important in addition to training have to do with overall culture setting and setting up environments and schedules of reinforcement and feedback that sustain good performance over time. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, can I just, I want to go back to the, the behavior skills training piece for a second. Uh, there's going to be many people in the audience who are 
well versed in that. Uh, but there's also quite a number of listeners who are students of behavior analysis. And for those people who haven't gotten to that chapter yet, um, <laughs> can you just give us the, the Reader's Digest version of the, the four steps or so of uh, BST? Absolutely. So this is a good thing to know, uh, no matter who you're trying to teach to do something that they haven't done before. So the first step for a, from a behavioral skills training perspective is to have effective instructions. This sometimes includes a rationale for why you need to do uh, what you should do the way you should do it. Um, and it will often include a description of the steps. Um you can create a permanent visual support like a job aid that gives you a reminder of those steps and even some important visuals of where you might find things or how you might do it. The next step is modeling, which is demonstration of the specific skill. And it is important to keep in mind that so much of what we want people to do is multi-step and kind of complicated. Right. And so having a lot of examples, either in a live demonstration or video examples of here's what it looks like when it's right, that really helps to establish um, kind of the person being able to exactly kind of visualize and see all of the things that are parts of what they should do and when they should do it. So that's a part we um, often put in there, so telling got... them how to do it and showing them how. Okay, cool. So the step one and two, right? That's step one and two. Steps three and four typically go hand in hand. So rehearsal, that means now the person who's learning gets the opportunity to actually do the new skill that we want them to be able to do. This could be implementing a program for a child with autism, taking data, um, offering choices to a confused older adult. But whatever it is, they now try it either in a role play situation where the person who's training them might be pretending to be the, um, the child with autism or what have you. Um, and sometimes they may rehearse with um, actually with the child. So this is the let's try it, actually do it. And then step four that goes hand in hand with that is feedback. So, you know, there are two kind of buckets of feedback, the first of which is praise for getting it right. And I think, um, you know, what's critical to keep in mind is to pay attention to what you want to see continue and increase. So actively describing with enthusiasm all the things that this person has gotten right on trying the new skill, um, which acknowledges kind of how hard it is to do something new, especially when someone's watching you. Sure. Um, yeah. That's always, uh, that's always fun, right? Yes. And then the other part that goes along with it is feedback about things that aren't quite right yet. And um, we often might call that um, corrective feedback and basically describing the parts that were right and then also describing this part of the protocol needs to look a little different. You can always flip back to step two and show again, but you're kind of describing this is the part that's not quite there yet. Here's exactly how to do it. And then you can repeat your rehearsal and practice opportunities. So that's why I say steps three and four, rehearsal and feedback, kind of go hand in hand like a dynamic loop. You mm -hmm. try it out. I give you some coaching. Let's try it again. I'll coach you again and tell you how great you're doing. Doing, and then we just shape your behavior to a very high performance criterion so that you feel confident in your implementation of the program and you hopefully have had a good learning experience and feel um, like you've had a lot of positive reinforcement in the training experience. So there are co four core steps. Um, but some people might say there's a fine art of making that feedback component really work as well as it could. And that fine art is predicated on the power of um, positive reinforcement 
and including enough of that in the training experience uh, for your um, for your staff. Cool, cool. Well, so it sounds like, and this is certainly true with many of the agencies that I've been involved with, you know, we do a good job of steps one and maybe some step two. And so it's the steps three and four, that model that oftentimes uh, go by the wayside for the, many of the reasons that I think you've already alluded to, you know, in terms of uh, time, response, effort, uh, and things like that. What are some other typical training mistakes you see as you're kind of out and about? Well, I will say um, that's a common one, that the initial training didn't involve that active training to criterion. And, um, you know, I always say they're not trained because you have a form that says they attended training. They're trained because you saw them do it accurately and hopefully even fluently, which means right and quickly and easily. But I think the other mistakes that I often see are once you have the initial performance going, you've trained someone, now they just need to do it and they need to continue doing it. Some of the common mistakes I see are that um, there's not an ongoing uh, praise and acknowledgement and reinforcement schedule by that supervisor. So we know is a core part of behavior analysis that behavior needs a sustaining schedule of reinforcement to keep it going. Otherwise, we call that extinction and behavior is going to go away. So um, if you want to sustain good performance, you have to have some kind of schedule of um, direct observation and reinforcement for that good performance. I think another thing that can go awry is that the environment may not be designed to make it easy to do the program well. So if you think about the kinds of things we might do as part of programming um, for a child with autism, we are going to have a lot of materials that we're using in our instruction. We may be offering a lot of different kinds of reinforcement. There may be... um, simple all the way to very complicated prompting schedules and all of that might need to occur really well under the conditions of a child is upset and perhaps maybe engaging in a tantrum or are not fully cooperating in the way that we might hope for and so if a person hasn't had the experience and have an environment that's designed to make it easy to be able to continue to implement that protocol under non-optimal conditions, then you've kind of trained for a world that might not exist. So once someone is good at implementing um, some kind of new program, you have to make sure that they also make the right choices when things don't go as well as they could and that they know where to seek help, that they um, have practiced under conditions where there might even be a behavior such as aggression or something like that, and that you've arranged your materials and reinforcers to be as readily available to them as possible at the times when they're going to need them. So there's a little bit of strategic design in where you're going to do that programming that decreases the response effort for doing your programming well. I see. So basically you want to make sure you train in uh, different environments, of course, and under varying levels of uh, duress, I guess, <laughs> um, and uh, make sure that the you know, kind of ecological variables are accounted for as it relates to materials, et cetera. So, so where, where does that – that sounds so familiar. I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I – I, I don't know where I've heard that, but, you know, we, we, we do this stuff with the, with the you know, uh, individuals yeah. we support. So, you know, um, so one of the things I was thinking about, too, is, you know, and this probably piggybacks to what you were saying, is you've written before about uh, the concept of procedural drift. And so one of the things I'm always curious about, especially in programs where, you know, we're sending therapists out in the home settings with where supervision is you know, at least in the direct teaching context is, 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 is not a possible. 
there might be check-ins and other sorts of things like that, but at least on a day-to-day basis, supervision is, is, is um, you know, uh, minimal at best. How do we get people to kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, do the right thing when no one's looking, you know, especially given that the negative consequences for doing something, you know, cutting corners and things like that aren't readily apparent. You know, you think that you know, no one goes into this line of work, you know, wanting to screw up, right? <laughs> That's uh, exactly right. So, People do not go to work wanting to do a bad job. They go to work wanting to enjoy their job and to do it well, but sometimes things go a bit awry. Um, you know, I think there are some common reasons for procedural drift, uh, and it occurs so often that you really need to count on it. You shouldn't count on there being no procedural drift. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of where that drift occurs. I think that un- one of the most common causes to procedural drift is that once a person knows how to implement a protocol and has done so quite frequently, they usually don't go back and read the original program. Instead, they behave as a product of their remembering of how they've done it before. And we all know what how the foibles of memory. Uh, we are not particularly accurate at remembering um, a variety of things, including where we put our keys to the fourth step of our morning chain as we're getting ready. So just basic human memory foibles will account for a lot of procedural drift if the person's not consistently kind of going back to that original program. The second thing is, as the deviations start to occur, they exist in an environment, and there may the child may respond differently to the deviation than they did to the original program implementation, and that shapes the behavior of the implementer of the program such that they're more likely to do that thing again. Um, So if you know there could be procedural drift, um, part of the what you can do to design a system that will minimize procedural drift is number one, have a supervisor present as often as you can, but that sometimes is hard as you just indicated. Um, you know, we try to use remote supervision, um, such as telehealth or um, the electronic data collection product that we use, uh, Catalyst, has the ability to record a brief video clip of your program that's then immediately available to your supervisor to watch it. And so that's one way to use technology to help that supervisor be more present, even when they're not physically in the room. I think you can also kind of make it part of the everyday activities of your team that they do have a shorter reminder version of that protocol. And the first thing you do when you get there is review the protocol, even if you've seen it a thousand times. And, you know, part of what we do is try to keep that protocol dynamic. So if there has been a change in the targets, in the prompt level, in the behavior that's going to be acceptable as we're shaping new responses, all of that should be in that cheat sheet that gets reviewed every day so that you're kind of operating from a more uh, perfect example, hopefully, of how you want the program to look. Cool, cool. Uh, One of the things I also want to ask about is you mentioned schedules of reinforcement as it relates to um, providing feedback to staff and things like that. So what are the ranges of you know, or what are some effective systems of, uh, uh, you know, and getting down to even a more granular level? W- what specific reinforcers have you seen used out there? Uh, I think in one of the articles that uh, I uh, have read uh, that you wrote, uh, you, you talked about, um, you gave examples of companies using monetary or other tangible rewards. So, you know, Given your kind of broad perspective on these matters, what are some effective reinforcers uh, and things like that? And then also, if in the realm of tangible and monetary rewards, 
Um, do you have some do's and don'ts or best practices as it relates to the use of those types of incentives or reinforces or whatever, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the best reinforcer is going to be the one that is the most readily available and the least expensive, especially if you have a lot of staff. And I think that is often social reinforcers. So just like with children with autism, as we might try to move from those tangible reinforcers to the more natural um, and social reinforcers, the same thing is true with our staff. You know, you want acknowledgement of your good work. You want the effects that you produce for your clients to be inherently reinforcing. And social praise and acknowledgement and noticing, whether it takes the form of a person-to-person -person interaction, an email about how well something's going or the wonderful feedback you're getting from other people. Those can all be very powerful um, social consequences. And we never want to forget to give as many of those as we possibly can. But in terms of other kinds of monetary or tangible um, consequences, you can certainly um, incorporate incentive pay. So that is, let's say if in procedural integrity scores um, are high or a certain level for a certain amount of time, there could well be an additional um, financial compensation that's kind of part of the pay rate. At Trumpet uh, Behavioral Health, which is a company that I um, work with, um, we actually have a system by which we evaluate the performance of our therapists throughout a three-month window on procedural integrity, appropriate accountability and documentation and high-quality data as well as professional and interpersonal interactions. And it allows them to be eligible for a raise um, up to every three months of the year. And so we kind of try to make that um, information about how you're doing in your job and um, compensation consequences for effective performance as frequent as we can. Now, if you're not in a position to do um, incentive compensation, permanent, ongoing raise to your um, to your compensation. You can always do small bonuses, gift cards, uh, those kinds of things. And you know there are uh, at least a few studies in the OBM literature that have actually looked at how you can do preference assessments for your employees in order to tailor those kinds of tangible. Um, incentives to the things that are going to be most reinforcing. So just like we might use a preference assessment with our client to find out what's going to be the best reinforcer for them, there are some methodologies for identifying the best reinforcers for your staff. So when using these types of systems, do you ever see kind of like a sour grapes complex on the part of folks who don't meet those criteria for either an incentive, you know, financial incentive or a, you know, some sort of tangible um, item reward or something like that? I think you definitely can see that. Um, and I think the part of it is the context in which and the means by which you implement your system. So if it's very clear that everyone is held to the same standard, and if the supervisor is working hard to help that team member attempt to achieve that standard, that will typically minimize some of the sour grapes. And, you know, having objective, observable uh, means by which you evaluate the performance is the difference maker. So you want it to be absolutely crystal clear that we can all like each other really well, but the ones who perform like X are the ones who will get Y. I see. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're my closest buddy or if we do not have a close relationship, that equitability is going to just be based on your behavior. And if you want to be able to behave differently, I'll help you do that so that you can achieve the same 
uh, outcome as someone else. So those kinds of incentives work better when they are available to everyone who meets the criterion rather than only the best one. I see. Does that make sense? So that sure. employee of the month can go awry when that one high performer means none of the rest of us ever get any good sure. stuff. So why do I need to work hard to be number two? Great. Um, we have lots of listeners who work in public school settings. And in those settings, it's really challenging at times because oftentimes the case manager who sometimes is a BCBA uh, or someone who is studying to become one or whatever has people, I'll say under their supervision, but they don't directly supervise. They're not administratively responsible for them. Uh, and so it sets up all these kind of weird situations where it's very, very difficult to uh, manage staff as perhaps actively as, as one would want to. And so in some of those settings also, and this, I don't want to get down a, a rabbit hole or anything like that, it, but there's not a real downside. There's not many negative consequences for not, you know, following uh, protocols, et cetera, um, for various reasons. What would you, what advice would you have for staff who are working in those sit settings where they don't, uh, they they need to influence behavior, right? Uh, kind of like getting back to what you, how you started the conversation, there, you know, once you move on from a one-to-one -one context, you're 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 in the 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 field of management, whether you like it or not. That's and right. um, but in, the, in these circumstances, we have very little control, you know, from a managerial standpoint. Um, you know, what what would your advice be to someone in that situation? Well, I think that's a very common situation, not only in schools, but it is almost always the situation um, in. Uh, geriatric care for those who are perhaps um, medically, physically, or cognitively compromised. So if you think about maybe some of our long-term care facilities, nursing homes, uh, assisted living, continuum of care kind of facilities, um, those facilities very seldom ever have behavior analysis in them. And if behavior analysis is present, it is present somewhat outside of the existing managerial structure. So it's that same situation of there's a, maybe a nurse manager or an occupational therapist who's kind of overseeing um, and uh, nurse technicians, certified nursing assistants, they're called. And that's really the line of reporting. And so, you know, you have to think about um, everything's an environment or a stimulus. And so I exist within this environment and I don't have a lot of control over the contingencies. I'm not the direct implementer of the contingencies. Um, so if that's the case, I have to be thinking about how can I influence the implementer of the contingencies. And that means I need to build some camaraderie and value to the manager in that infrastructure to help them understand why changing their staff's behavior is going to result in something good for the patients that they're caring about and assuming that's a motivation, and I find that it almost always is, when you can align yourself with the existing management structure and convince them to allow you to help observe and define what really great performance is and maybe even build in a low effort uh, contingency management system for them um, that's a great way to kind of recruit the natural implementer of contingencies to be your partner and be a little bit more aligned with um, how you might approach things. I also think there's good opportunity on the front end, the antecedent end, to make it as easy as possible to implement your programs. Um, I will say this. 
partially because uh, I'm not the boss in, in these kinds of nursing care environments, I am very aware that anything I recommend had better be so easy you barely notice you're doing it because you're adding it into a very effortful, full um, set of activities for a nursing assistant who's usually caring for four, five, six, up to eight people at a time. So I think about ways that I can redesign their environment. For example, um, we did a study where um, we were working in an elder care environment and there was a, um, a, a patient there, an older woman. She was very interested in socializing with the staff because they were a little bit more cognitively aware than the other residents there. And she was constantly just walking into their office while they were trying to get some appropriate documentation and things done. And um, we were able to kind of redesign the, um, the setup of that office and the, use a visual barrier that such that the client would walk up to it and kind of see a certain visual um, cloth right at her eye level that served as a cue to don't come in right now, we're busy. Mm -hmm. And that was able to just kind of like be there like the wallpaper rather than you have to respond a certain way and redirect her a hundred times during the day. Let's just arrange the environment to try to use antecedents to prevent um, issues. A variety of those kinds of things, I think, make it easy and hardly noticeable that you're doing the program. And so we can design lots of complicated things, but in some environments, you might as well have designed nothing because it's not going to be implemented. So it's that wise choice as... Um, as you are creating your programming. Wow. That was probably the most clever segue of topics uh, I've had since I started the podcast. <laughs> so you, you, you just seamlessly, uh, you know, a transition from uh, OBM into gerontology, which is the next item on the agenda. So uh, well, well done, not only in presentation, but also in substance, uh, uh, Linda. So, um, so now that we're in this uh, other category, you know, yeah. uh, gerontology is in a field I'm not, uh, and as it relates to the behavior analytic intervention in these settings, I'm not terribly familiar with it. So can you spend uh, a minute or two and kind of just describe what, you know, um, what, what is done in this field? You know, you know what, what are some things that uh, those of us who are working with, you know, kids with disabilities and things like that who aren't familiar with these areas, you know, tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in the world of um, behavior analytic interventions in um, uh, geriatric populations. Absolutely. Well, um, probably most of our listeners are going to recognize that there is a, a rapidly growing uh, group of um, individuals that are um, what we might call older adults. It might shock you to know that our basic developmental literature um, can, and the AARP consider uh, an older adult starting at age 55. And, um, you know, our society has changed so much over the last 40 years. It used to be the case that um, people were really beginning to think about exiting the workforce or um, just the structure of their lives were changing a lot by their later 50s. Um, it's rarely the case now. So we tend to think more of older adults as starting at age 65 rather than 55. Um, but then there are groupings of that group from 65 to 75, 75 to 85, 85 and up. And we now are, um, you know, kind of existing in a society where a, uh, a portion of us will live to be beyond the age of 85, but the majority of us will not. Our average life expectancy is still in the high 70s, which is way higher than it used to be. So, you know, I think the world would be wonderful if we lived so much longer and remained completely healthy and cognitively intact for that entire time. 
but those two things don't always go hand in hand. So I think as um, if so for someone interested in behavioral gerontology, there are these kinds of buckets of activity and literature that can be very interesting and a great opportunity to have an impact and do some social good. The first is for many people, um, just naturally occurring health conditions or what we might call lifestyle related health conditions, a product of maybe not eating as well as you could, exercising as much as you could, um, those kinds of diseases start to influence the health condition quite a bit more uh, once you are in your 50s. And so there's a lot of great work being done on basically helping older adults or even what we might call later middle-aged adults, people in their 50s to pursue healthier diets, better exercise regimens, focusing on strength and flexibility, managing their anxiety conditions with um, strategies besides perhaps alcohol, all of the same kinds of choices that we might all make that suddenly start to have a bigger impact on our health. And cumulatively, they um, begin to lead to conditions such as diabetes. And um, that's probably one of the most common ones. Is ha We've had a rapid um, and substantial increase in the number, uh, particularly of older adults who have what's called type 2 diabetes, where... Mm -hmm. You kind of worn out your pancreas right. and your regulatory systems. And so designing um, environments and stimuli and and sometimes even programming reinforcement contingencies to help them be able to adhere to their medical regimens um, or to, you know, whether it's medication and, or it is changing behaviors, that's a big part. Um, another example of this is um, getting older adults to consume more healthy uh, fluids, such as water, because as you get older, and especially if you're taking medicine, you have a higher uh, water consumption need, and it will impact your health uh, more significantly if you are marginally dehydrated or significantly dehydrated. So those kinds of basic behavioral health psychology, it's such a really cool area to be able to do good work. And it integrates so well with primary care because those kinds of folks are seeing their primary care physician. And the, it's often the primary care physician feels like they're starting to lose ground. You've got more problems than I can easily manage with pills, and I need you to work hard with me to make up some of this ground that we're losing, whether it's on your flexibility, your diet, your weight, your whatever it might be, your vision. And I think that um, behavior analysts um, who are willing to work in primary care settings have a great opportunity to kind of help people be able to change their own behavior in ways that are going to lead to long-term sustained better health. So I think that's one of the buckets that's super cool. Um, what most people think of when they think of behavioral gerontology is probably caring for those who already have a significant disability condition. It could be a health condition that leads them to be less mobile. Um, it could be a, an, what we might call an acquired cognitive Im, um, uh, impairment uh, in the form of a dementia. There are lots of causes of dementia, but it basically leads you to be um, usually progressively less capable of independence and effective decision making and that kind of thing. And it may increase the likelihood that you're unable to live independently and may need an environment of support to allow you to remain uh, safe. So there's a lot of great work that has been done and is being done on things like, um, well, I 
uh, Dr. Mark Matthews, who's well known in the area of behavioral gerontology, and I kind of co-mentored a student on a, a thesis where we were looking at in, in nursing homes where folks are often confused and uh, all the hallways look exactly the same. One of the things that often happens is people go into the wrong room and they either recognize this is not my stuff and they become very confused and upset. Who's taken my things? I'm lost. Where am I? Or they don't notice at all and they just, you know, they're Goldilocks. They lay down in that bed and and they are um, and then someone else becomes upset because their confusion has led them to kind of invade the privacy or personal space of another person. So you can see how, you know, we need a nice antecedent to prevent that kind of thing occurring. And what we were looking at were um, what kinds of self-reference stimuli would be more readily um, evoking of their behavior. So we actually looked at their printed name, which most of us see almost every day of our lives, and pictures of themselves that were very recent, from middle age, and from their youth. And we posted these things. We did um, a variety of assessments to see which ones they would recognize as, they, as them or theirs. Um, and then we used that information to guide stimuli that we put outside their door such that they might be walking down that hall and see a picture of themselves that they recognize and know to walk into that room. So again, it's that notion of using what we know about stimulus control and antecedents to make it a, a super easy just hang the picture kind of an intervention. And in fact, um, that proved uh, useful in eliminating some of that getting lost and going into the wrong room. I love those, I love those simple types simple of uh, interventions. interventions. And I say simple I, not as a uh, uh, pejorative, of course. Uh, elegant, I guess, is perhaps the, the research equivalent of that. So it's nice. I, I, think, I, I think of it as elegant. Right. If it's simple and effective, that's elegant. The, the, it is always better when a simple thing will work as well as a more complicated thing. Indeed. Indeed. Um, does the market exist right now for the hiring of behavior analysts? You know, it reminds me as I was kind of reading up on this that, it, you know, it, is this something – akin to the late 90s, early 2000s, where there was a the number of behavior analysts were starting to grow, certainly not growing at the rate it is right now. And, you know, a lot of us were out there trying to basically sell our services or <laughs> promote them to schools and other sorts of places. And now it's the other way around. Schools are trying to recruit behavior analysts and things like that. Yeah. Um you know, is 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 the field of behavioral gerontology uh, poised for a a similar type of growth cycle that the uh, autism intervention has um, has experienced? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I um, of course no one has a crystal ball, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No one has a crystal ball. The the uh, the need is strong although that community doesn't necessarily know we exist or that they need us. And so um, I published a paper with a couple of colleagues, one of my former PhD students, John Baker, and one of my former PhD students, uh, Dr. Megan Heineke, who were interested in two areas, behavioral gerontology and traumatic brain injury. And um, most of their buddies in grad school were not. <laughs> so they were each kind of a little bit the odd duck. Everyone else is an autism and intellectual disabilities uh, kind of specific person. And, and I do this other stuff and it's amazing. And I, I want to be able to um, get more of people out there in my field. Um, we're fortunate um, both of them are now professors doing the good work to try to make more of us interested. But 
I think there are a couple of issues that are barriers to expanding into new areas. And I think they're very understandable from a behavioral perspective. The first is if you haven't, if you're already out there, you're part of the workforce, and you think that might be interesting, you don't necessarily have a lot of applied experience and knowledge in that area. And you're going to have to learn at least some about these health conditions, causes of dementia. You're going to have to operate within a system that's different. And so there's response effort associated with um, let me do a new thing that's going to feel hard, even if it's exciting, versus let me keep doing what I'm already good at. And I think the other thing is um, there's a lot of just the the alternative reinforcement for autism and intellectual disabilities is so high. I mean, it's just a ridiculous number of jobs that are available. It is the opportunity to so, do social good, to be well paid, and in many instances to operate within a, a behavioral infrastructure as opposed to being the behavioral guy in the system. So I am dubious that hordes of our ilk are going to switch <laughs> to behavioral gerontology <laughs> and traumatic brain injury when there is such a robust employment environment for folks in autism and intellectual disabilities. Now, I'm part of that robust employment environment, and so uh, I'm not likely to stop hiring folks. I want that to continue, but I think if someone really wants to, you know, get the exciting new set of reinforcers associated with working with a new population or in new environments, the opportunities are there. And the paper that we wrote kind of lays out what you would need to do to not only establish the competencies, but to create a little bit of a market for yourself. I have not had many problems in getting people to say, yes, I'd like you to do that for me. When I have approached them in um, nursing care settings or um, uh, adult daycare kinds of settings and described the kinds of things that I would like to help them do to enhance the quality of their services or their organization, I think the person who's going to be successful in that environment really has to be committed to you are going into their environment and you have got to really be um, a little bit of a salesperson um, and, a, and a, a representative and a socially skilled representative of our, of our field such that you start with the assumption they don't yet value this stuff Nobody values change very much, no. and so they darn well better value me, <laughs> and that will be my entree into um, having the opportunity to make change that becomes inherently and naturally reinforcing to them such that they want more of the change I can offer. I see. Uh, very cool. Yeah, I, you know, it just uh, – it's just interesting given that the, as you so nicely described, the need is there. There's so many different ways in which I think behavior analysts could be effective in that environment. And just trying to get that exposure uh, is probably hard to kind of knock those barriers down. And I, um, you know, knowing some folks in the medical profession and things like that, it is a little bit, you know, uh, of a fraternity of such, uh, you know, in some respects as well. Much like being around teachers, you know, they, they, you know, sometimes it's hard to, you know, kind of fresh ideas. And as you said, change and all those sorts of things. Sometimes it, there's some natural skepticism, uh, particularly if you have folks coming from a, a, a medical model of you know, understanding uh, behavior right. and things like that. So That's right. And I think you have to recognize that is their model and that is their worldview. And um, there's a lot of really important information in that medical world. So, you know, I think the more and someone who's interested in this can 
learn that information, like the times when I can speak knowledgeably about the different causes of dementia or my knowledge about the likely impact of a urinary tract infection on um, confusion and the probability that that's a, a source that could be contributing to a variety of unusual behaviors. That basic knowledge and the fact that you took the time to learn that often, like you really have to be the first one to reach out your hand. I've made the effort to learn all of these things and I have a few things to offer as well. And you offer that hand and allow them to maybe reciprocate and learn a few of your things as well. Very cool. Very cool. Um, we have a time for maybe a, a couple questions left. I, I want to ask a question on behalf of uh, one of our listeners. Uh, Lori wrote in and said, uh, what I'd like to hear about most from Dr. LeBlanc is how to set up an ethics committee at an agency like she did with Trump at Behavioral Health. Evidently, you were speaking about that at a, uh, at a in a course or a conference or something like that. She continues, I would love to hear a step-by-step -step of how she got this started and how the process works. That's great. That's a, a wonderful question. And um, I'm happy to elaborate on it. And, you know, one, one of these days, maybe I'll even write a paper describing it. Um, but in the meantime, this podcast could be one of the ways that we get the word out. There we go. Uh, yeah. So, you know, when I joined um, Trumpet Behavioral Health, part of my um, charge and responsibility was to kind of establish all of the systems for clinical standards, oversight, um, and I viewed part of that also as culture, that um, in addition to having some policies and procedures and resources, I wanted to kind of be a model for how I wanted our seven, 800 person team to experience their professional world and to how to think about what we're doing. And so for me, that clearly also encompassed thinking and behaving ethically. And, you know, one of the means by which I thought I could do this was to establish um, what I called the ethics network. So um, step one was to just start um, behaving and putting information in the environment to get people excited about ethics. So in many of the meetings that I would have, I would make a brief mention of, hey, do you know this situation's kind of similar to this part of our ethics code? And there's a language about we should think this way or behave this way. So I basically just started off as being a relatively knowledgeable person in the environment and talking um, in an excited way <laughs> about um, ethics and how to think about things ethically to establish that as relatively reinforcing. And there were some people who took the bait. They were like, oh, that's really cool. And they would actually maybe go ask a follow-up question or ask about what's this situation. So, you know, it was almost like I kind of baited the environment to see who would come. And all who would come I then created a community. So I said, let's develop a committee. We can meet every other week and just spend a little bit of time talking about ethics, this stuff that you clearly think is cool or you wouldn't have taken the bait. Um, and we'll protect that time. And then we'll start thinking about what can we do to share this good stuff. And so kind of the Bucket of step one is really about establishing the value and the reinforcing properties of ethics, which uh, takes a little I was gonna time say, yeah. and <laughs> purposeful action, but uh, some of us really like that stuff. Um, 
So once I had some people kind of excited about this, they were putting some discretionary time into it. Um, then we had a community that we could uh, view ourselves as having something to offer the rest of the company. So we kind of identified uh, four or five strategies that we could use to kind of spread the effect of um, knowledge and excitement about ethics and the notion of you want it to be proactive. Think about this weird situation that could occur and how it matters ethically before you're ever in that situation so that you know how to respond when it happens rather than, uh-oh, I think I screwed up. Well, that kind of brings so, it full circle to where we started the conversation and training in, you know, various environments and, you know, when things are going wrong and, you know, we're practicing for that sort of thing. That's exactly right. And I'll tell you, um, you, you almost can't be creative enough to think of the really wacky stuff that will actually happen um, at least some of the time. So the first strategy that we thought we needed was a good, exciting, engaging ethics training for everyone. And so we developed an instructional design module called Ethical Problem Solving. And it kind of walks you through a little bit on the code, but more about these are the core things that underlie the code. Do no harm, respect boundaries, always be professional, Etc. And, um, and those kinds of things, they're going to show up in every situation. If you're paying attention to those, your um, your radar is going to go off uh, if an unethical situation is happening. You're going to recognize it early. So that training was a core part of it, and and every a uh, person employed at Trumpet Behavioral Health, including our administrative teams, now goes through an instructional design module that helps them kind of understand the basics of our um, ethical responsibility. The second um, thing was we wanted to get people t talking about and thinking about ethics every day. So we started designing these little what we would call uh, monthly talking points or fun facts. So, for example, we might um, describe a scenario like you are working with a family with autism and the parent asks you what you think about an alternative uh, medicine kind of treatment for their child. And, of course, you're six months into the field because you're a therapist who just went through great BST training. What the heck are you supposed to say? <laughs> you know, you you may have a general opinion about that. You don't want to offend anybody. And so we would actually describe that scenario and then walk them through. This code matters. This code matters. And here are three to five different ways you could say it that will be absolutely in the bounds of safe. I think it's better for you to talk to the clinician about that. Would you like me to send them an email to let them know that you had this question? I'm not sure what the evidence base is behind that, but I love the opportunity to look at the literature. Would you like me to see if there are any articles? And I'd be happy <laughs> to share what I find. Yeah, you know, like just a variety of these, like, oh man, that's great, but I never would have thought of it in the moment. And that allows a supervisor to kind of have this resource to be able to practice it um, with their team members. So we would distribute those sometimes it's smaller like just a little email fun fact about hey this part of our code uh talks about this and here's an example of of what you can do but just brief and putting that in people's environment much more frequently i think for a lot of folks ethics is the stuff you think about after you screwed something up and we really wanted to saturate our culture with uh, knowledge and information and resources um, about ethics kind of on the front end. We also do at least a, an annual bigger training on some topic that is um, kind of periodically comes up and that'll usually be like a one hour CEU opportunity. Um, and then the final part is we have what's called the ethics hotline. 
So I established that hotline. And to be honest with you, in order to get this system occurring, I had to be willing to just do heavy lifting. I had to, if nobody else came up with an idea, I had to have an idea for those monthly fun facts. I had to come up with a training topic and make that training, unless other people um, had the interest to participate. With the ethics hotline, it's something that any of our team members can submit at any time if they feel like a situation's a little unusual, they have a question, it's an, a, a form, uh, electronic form that they fill out and that shoots an email. For many years, it was directly to me and they could indicate whether it was an emergency and I needed to call them back as quickly as possible or that they were just thinking about it and our ethics committee could kind of take a few days to compose a response. Now, it meant... I had to always be monitoring my email, right? Mm, so at the tough. end of every meeting, I quickly scanned, is there an ethics submission? Um, which can, I mean, there's a little bit of burden that goes along with that. So if you're really wanting to set this up in your agency, someone has to be excited to accept that burden. I'll tell you the positive part of it is there were people who submitted, help me right now. I don't know if I need to call Child Protective Services. And I saw that and I called them within five to 20 minutes and we talked through it and they were so thankful. And, you know, people find themselves in situations they don't know what to do. If they can get quick help or if they can get help before they've done something wrong, it puts them in a position to really be um, not only grateful, but almost more sensitized to the value of this ethics stuff. So um, I think that that hotline is a core part of it, that people feel like someone smart will be available to me and they will help me get through this. And there'll never be a situation that I need to hide from someone because I screwed up. Um, and so creating that culture where you have no punishment at all for someone bringing forward an ethical situation, a problem, or even this is what I did, was that an oops? That's part of how you arrange the contingencies in your environment. Praise and reinforce bringing those, I noticed an ethical thing forward and um, and never punish. Instead, let's fix it together. And I think that over time, that establishes the contingencies in that um, in that applied community for behaving in ways that are generally going to be more ethical. So that's what it did. Certainly beats uh, sweeping it under the rug, I guess. Uh, so. <laughs> yes, it does. Beats sweep it under the rug. <laughs> Linda, thanks for sharing that. And Lori, thanks for sending that uh, very cool question in. I wouldn't have thought of that. So appreciate the help. Um, we are coming up on some time constraints here. So I'm going to ask you to close with some parting uh, with, uh, thoughts advice, et cetera, for aspiring behavior analysts or newly minted ones. And I will also say we left a bunch of questions on the table here. So uh, maybe we can do a Linda LeBlanc uh, round two. So uh, so um, what are your thoughts? Any 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 parting advice for people who are uh, you know just getting into the field? Oh, yeah, maybe so. You know, I, I spent 15 years um, helping those newbies just get into the field. I was a professor at um, three different universities. And it's so exciting when you are um, just getting into the field and you have got all of this new knowledge and your head's just bursting with the the potential for good that you can do because you think so differently than you did before. Um, and then you kind of go out into the world and it's like, boom, okay, there's the real world. Um, so I do think the, my this isn't first, in Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally not in the white book. Are you kidding me? Um, so I think my first bit of advice would be related to, um, you know, when you go into the that new environment, whether it's your first job, 
whether it's in a school district or even a behavioral uh, provider agency, maybe it could even be uh, somewhere in geriatric care, um, remind yourself, this isn't graduate school. And I still need to learn, but I now need to behave effectively in the environment that I am in. So if you are kind of still behaving too much as if you are in that graduate school environment, it might lead you to mistakenly behave as if everyone around you is already kind of drunk the Kool-Aid and part of that behavioral community rather than monitoring what you say and kind of how you are finessing your relationships. Um, so recognize that you're in a new environment and there's new stuff to master and um, that you kind of have to respond in the environment you're in, not the environment you used to be in. And then I would say um, reflect on what you still want to learn. Um, sometimes folks that are relatively new in the field, they they really recognize, oh my gosh, I haven't done these things before and I'm, I'm a little fearful to kind of get in there and even use what I know. Um, you can also get the flip of, I'm so confident of what I know that I don't recognize situations in which I might not really be ready to succeed and there are maybe a few things I also don't know that are embedded in this situation. So the the best thing that I think you can do is find yourself a mentor, someone who's already knowledgeable, already successful, and who might be interested in kind of helping to show you the ropes uh, a little bit and to help you continue to be excited about learning new things um, in your new environment. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I was fortunate enough to have a couple of really helpful mentors along my way. And uh, yeah, I, I also like the idea of kind of understanding and the the uh, things you don't know, the, the known unknowns, or I don't know, there's a saying a while that was going around for a while ago about that, and I can't recall exactly how it goes. But yeah, good stuff. Um, wow. Well, that was a very fast uh, hour and 12 minutes or so. So <laughs> Um, and well, thank I, you so much for having me. It's been fun, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to showcase a little bit of other kinds of opportunities that behavior analysts could uh, pursue if they're interested. Great, great. Well, thanks for coming on the program, and uh, hopefully we can have you back as uh, you know we, like I said, ha have more questions that we didn't get to, and I'm sure this will generate a lot of uh, feedback from the listeners as well. So. Uh, Dr. Linda LeBlanc, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Matt. All right, take care. Hey, everybody. I hope you learned as much as I did during that interview, and I really appreciate Linda for being so gracious with her time. I think I'm going to keep my post-show commentary brief here because we're already way over the hour mark, and so, um, yeah, I won't belabor the point too much longer. The only couple of things I will just kind of remind you of is that, uh, again, if you're going to APBA, uh, please uh, please say hello. We'd love to meet uh, listeners who are attending. And then again, if you're interested in continuing education credit for some of the episodes, uh, go to Behavioral Observations, click the Get CEs tab, and you can learn more about that. I've got three episodes that are available for CEs right now, and I'll have more coming in the future. So, uh, I think that's pretty much it, and I look forward to seeing you in session 23. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.